So I'm Paul Fisher. I'm director of the program in human biology. This is my seventh year directing, so it's fun to be here. It's a pleasure to be here. And my job is to tell you a little bit about HumBio, but then I'm also going to use a case study, a, a case to sort of set the table for what's going to go on this quarter in terms of what you're going to learn in terms of genetics, population biology, other basic cell biology, a little bit about society, civilization, and so forth. So let's sort of take it away. So I like to start with me because I like to make it all about me, but not really. Um, depending on your point of view, the failing or the promising New York Times, I like to read it. And so this article now two years ago, September of 2016, caught my attention uh, because what I do is I've been treating you know, my other day job when I'm not in human biology. I'm over in the medical school and I deal with children. I direct the brain tumor or brain cancer clinic. So brain cancer, good or bad, is now the leading killer of children. It's actually the leading killer of, in childhood cancer. It's the leading cause of death in children under age 15. And that's what I've been doing. So it's obviously a big challenge. You can say maybe I'm not doing a good enough job. But one of the things I thought when I see a piece like this, you know, we hear it on CNN, you see it on Twitter or Facebook, wherever you get your news, I should go back and look at the primary source. Hopefully we'll convey this to you throughout the course of the year, course of the quarter, that evidence is important. So I did. I went back to this report. It's from the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta, Sally Curtin and crew. And it's basically on the y-axis. It's a percent distribution of different types of cancers in children. And you can see here in 1999, leukemia was sort of, quote, reigning king in terms of fatalities or deaths in children. It accounted for nearly 30% of cancer-related deaths in kids, uh, but we've gotten a lot better in leukemia. Uh, we haven't gotten quite as good, though, in brain tumors. So about three out of 10 children who die from cancer in the US and worldwide die of a brain tumor. That's a pretty, pretty tough thing. So I was in your place. I sat here in lovely Geo Corner, circa 1980. You can figure out my age if you're bored. And so I guess I was version 11.0 or something like that of the HumBio core. And so I could sort of rewind the clock and say, well, what knowledge will I need in my journey to confront brain cancer? How am I going to figure out how to deal with this problem? Because clearly, it's a really important problem. It's not just the biology. This is a disease that destroys families. It hurts children. And it comes at a huge cost to society. So, I'm going to need things like cell biology, genetics, population biology. I'm going to need my tool case. I'm going to need molecular biology, immunology. I'm obviously going to need neuroscience. We're talking about the brain. I'm going to need to understand human physiology. I'll need to understand a little bit about a family's beliefs and cultures. Not everyone greets therapy for a brain tumor the same way. Everyone comes with very much their own understanding of what their culture is. I'm going to need to understand how children grow and develop. And obviously, if I'm going to sort of negotiate this and get progress on my cause, I want NIH, I want Congress, Congress to fund money for brain tumor research. I'm going to need to understand public policy, both for the health and environment. So I guess in a, a nutshell, kind of an unabashed commercial, I'm going to need the, the information that's in the human biology core. And these are the topics you're going to get in the human biology core this year. I would say, you know, I'm sort of a poster child of HumBio, I guess, in the sense that in my career, I'm very interdisciplinary in what I do, and that's what human biology is going to do. The mission of HumBio is to provide this interdisciplinary approach. We're not going to look at things just monochromatically, look at them one way only, because every problem can be looked at in multiple different perspectives, multiple angles. And there's also room, not only for the evidence, but there's room for opinions, right? So we're going to look at understanding the human being, not only from biology, but also behavior, society, and cultural perspectives. So we're going to need to understand the human being from all of this. Here we're going to start, just give you a little preview of the core, and then we're going to come back to a case study. So the core is this, where you are right now, 2A, 2B at 10 o'clock. And you'll have 3A, 3B for those of you who go on through the core in the year, 4A, 4B. I hope to see you back in 4A when we do neuroscience. But we're going to provide a very broad and rigorous introduction in the core to the biological and behavioral sciences. For those of you who go on to major in human biology, you're going to go in further depth 
and breadth. You're going to start looking at particular problems. I spent a lot of time back in the 80s looking at child development and how kids, kids grow and how, they, how the world shapes them. And then obviously you're going to hopefully apply, apply this approach during your time at Stanford, whether, it, whether it's scholarship things like doing an honors thesis or HB Rex. Nice plug for that if you're interested in HB Rex research opportunities during sophomore summer. Professor Preston in the back would be a good person to talk to. Um, but you want to use this approach beyond, okay? And I still use this approach today. So I'm going to go through a first case study in human biology. So I want to introduce a, a young boy. So this boy here in the, uh, right over here next to his dad, this is DJ. And so I met DJ in 2005. So he was around age seven. If he did a little bit of quick math, he would be a senior in college right now, today here in 2018. But when I met him back in 2005, he was seven and he was diagnosed with a brain tumor. We're not going to get too hung up in the terms, but the name of this brain tumor is called medulloblastoma. And this is a very fatal, aggressive cancer. Right now, we're able to cure maybe about 30% of the kids. But it's a tumor, and so here's a picture, a cartoon of the brain, kind of sideways. Here's the big part, the cerebrum. Here's the spinal cord and the stem of the brain, kind of like an upside down pumpkin as I would explain it to someone who doesn't know much about uh, neurophysiology. And then there's this hindbrain here, the cerebellum. And what happened for DJ is, whoops, like that. So he developed this tumor right in the middle of his cerebellum. So that's a pretty difficult spot to have a tumor, maybe better than some other spots in the brain, but it's in a place, you know, the brain's kind of important. All of you are using it right now. And so, we're going to have to deal with it. Let me just sort of show you what it looks like here. We're not going to get too medical, and I don't want to get too medical. But again, this is sort of that sideways image here. This is what's called an MRI. You'll see some of these with David Lyons when he talks about PTSD and other types of neuroimaging. And it'll come up a little bit also in spring quarter, but it's a sideways picture in this big white blob here. This one, this is a tumor. This is the cerebellum. And this is all tumor or cancer right there. This is another patient, not DJ, but this tumor likes to go down along your spinal column. So this is the back here. If you felt the surface of your back, these sort of building blocks here in a stack, these are your vertebrae, your vertebral bodies, and this is the spinal cord here. And you can see here, this is tumor all along the spine. Pretty tough spot to deal with. So uh, just one more too, because this is going to be, we're going to talk about genetics and cellular biology throughout the quarter. If you actually took out the cerebellum, here it is, here's a view, you'd have this tumor that's growing here, right in the middle of the cerebellum. And this is kind of like cells gone bad. So if you looked at a normal cerebellum, if any of you have ever volunteered in the lab or looked in a book, not that you should have, but if you did, this is sort of what the normal cerebellum looks like. It's got this very nice orderly layer. There's something called the molecular layer on the outside. On the inside, there's something called the granular cell layer. There are these Purkinje cells, but this doesn't look anything like that, right? You, know, you could be just sort of an art, art appreciation person and say, gee, those, they don't really, they don't look like at all. And in fact, what it is, is this proliferation, this massive growth of cells. So these are all cancer cells. So this is all cancer that has to be removed, has to be eradicated. We've got to do something or otherwise it'll take over the whole brain and the spine. So, a couple questions always come up to me. When someone is with you right there in the moment, like DJ was in 2005, I don't have a lot of time to figure out how this happened, right? It's all hands on deck. I have to do something right now. So I gotta figure out how to treat this tumor. And then secondly though, you know, once you've been doing this, I've been doing brain tumors now since 1992 between Hopkins and Stanford, and after a while, after you've seen about a thousand kids or so, you really starts to eat at you. And you want to know why this happens. Maybe we could prevent this. Maybe we could figure out therapies and treatments that are less toxic, less hurtful, things like that. So let me just tell you a little bit more about DJ's tumor. So it's a malignant or cancerous tumor of the back part of the brain, the cerebellum. To treat this tumor, it's about a year's worth of therapy. The surgeon will go in, 
and try to remove the tumor out of the cerebellum. And we've got really great surgeons here. Just saw them this morning, good bunch. And then they'll we'll radiate the brain and the spine. And so many of you have been all over. Some of you have been in hospitals, clinics, or you've gone through TSA and things like that. No one wants to get extra radiation. Radiation is not good, particularly to a growing brain. And in a growing brain, it can cause intellectual disability, what was previously known as mental retardation. So that's kind of a hard pill to swallow to say, gee, we can cure you of this tumor, but it's going to come at a big cost. You might become, because of this, learning challenged. You might have learning disabilities or frank intellectual disability. So about 70% of the kids are cured with this approach. We also give chemotherapy over the course of about 45 weeks. Pretty toxic drugs, but the kids are left with, as I already mentioned, intellectual disability. Many wind up with hearing loss, needing hearing aids, and they have a lot of deficiencies of hormones. Hormones are things like your thyroid or growth hormone. Interesting fact, this is something that I've always been intrigued by, and I have to give a shout out because Emily, so Emily Curran, who was a HumBio student in the core years ago, and then did some work with me. And so Emily did some interesting work. She's a grown up and a practicing oncologist at the University of Chicago. But in looking at the data, looking at large population data sets, we know the following. More boys get this tumor than girls, yet the girls who are diagnosed are younger and they survive better. And it doesn't seem to have anything to do with the X chromosome. It's kind of curious, uh, but I'll come back to that a little bit. Normal cell. Show of hands. How many people made a cell project at some point during elementary or middle school? How many people used pipe cleaners for ribosomes? <laughs> How many people know what a pipe cleaner is? <laughs> All right. So you know, this is sort of a normal cell, and I went through that process. My daughter's 24. I remember making this really neat cell project. We had this great idea, well, okay, I had the idea, that we would take all that stuff, the pipe cleaners and the buttons and all that kind of stuff, and put it in wax. It was awesome. <laughs> Teachers loved it. She did a great job. She did her work. I think she got an A. But then she left it by the windowsill. And that's not good. The cell kind of gets all warped and weird or mutated. And that's not good. You don't want a cell to mutate or change. Because cells are supposed to be very controlled. Right now, all your cells are behaving very nicely, I think. You're all sitting there, you're thinking, you're doing all sorts of normal cellular function. I like that. The other part, too, we've got the growth cycle. How many people have seen a picture of something like this, the cell cycle of growth? Pretty common. You kind of go through it. Maybe in biology in the 10th or 11th grade, 9th grade. Or if you're really fast, maybe in the second grade for some of you, whatever. Um, you learn about this. And you hear about things like the growth phases. You hear about G1, G2. You hear about the S phase synthesis, where DNA, sort of the, the product of your genetic code. And then mitosis, where cells split. You hear all about this. But you just kind of accept it at face value, right? You know, it's like, well, there's this circle. And every now and then, we pull them out of the game. They rest here on the side, G0. But like, why? Like, why is no one growing in this room right now? So far, Professor Talbot has stayed the same size the last seven years. His height has not changed, not to my knowledge. So I'm assuming something in his body is saying, don't grow. Stop. So there are checkpoints in the cell. But if those checkpoints aren't right, the cells are going to be out of control of growth. And in, in really, in a very simplistic way, that's what cancer is. Cancer is uncontrolled or dysregulated growth. We would like growth to be very normal and orderly. I don't want to see any of you, you know, if you grow two feet during me, on me during a lecture, I'm going to be kind of freaked out by the end of the 40 minutes. So we don't want that to happen. We want nice, normal, orderly cell growth. Well, sometimes that doesn't happen, and that's what happens particularly in medulloblastoma. So it's a cancer where there's uncontrolled or unchecked growth of the cell. I kind of glossed over it briefly, and you're going to hear all about this throughout the quarter. You're going to hear about genes or pieces of DNA, pieces of your genetic code that translate to RNA and then make proteins. I'm not going to get too far into that right now, but I'm going to say you could take a tumor. We could take pieces of it in a laboratory. We could sort of grind them up, digest them, so to speak, put them in test tubes, 
look at the DNA, look at the RNA of the tumor, and really try to figure out what's wrong. Why did the genes sort of come uncoupled? You know, anybody from San Francisco? Ever park your car in the city? On a hill? You know, so why doesn't she like to park her car on the hill? Your brakes slip, and boom, it goes, crashes. So same thing here. If the cell starts to slip, we get very grave problems. And that's the problem here. So we're going to try to figure out what's wrong with the brakes, what's wrong with the DNA or the RNA, and we're going to look for mutations. And what we're looking here, I'm going to introduce a word. We're going to talk, look, talk about mutations that are just in the tumor, not the whole body. We're kind of very used to thinking about all the cells in our body having the same DNA and doing the exact same thing, but they don't. And so sometimes there's just a mutation in part of the body or just a small part of the brain, and we call that a somatic mutation. It's not the whole body, just that part, like in DJ's tumor in his cerebellum. I want to know what's up with the DNA or RNA in those cells. What happened to uncouple it? What un unleashed the brakes on the car? Why is it going un out of control? Well, let me sort of jump uh, ahead a little bit here. So I've devoted a lot of time to this as about 30 or 40 other colleagues. We get together once a year, usually in winter climate places. Um, and there's been some real groundbreaking work in this tumor, and particularly when you've been doing something for 30 years and not much progress happens over the first 20, it gets a little disappointing. But around 2011, 2012, out of the University of Toronto and a few other places, it became clear that not all these medulloblastomas are the same. <laughs> Anybody in this room have the name Jones? Smith? You know any other Smiths? No. Anyone on campus named Smith? I'm sure. They're probably all related to you, right? Most likely. Most likely. Probably not. <laughs> so all medulloblastomas, just because they look the, the same under a light microscope, because of somebody in the 1950s or 40s who looked at it and said, oh, it looks like a medulloblastoma, doesn't mean they're all the same. I'm going to assume not all Smiths have the same DNA, and I know that all medulloblastomas don't have the same DNA that's not working right, the same genes. And in fact, what the people in the University of Toronto with some others did is we were able to actually cluster and found that in the tumor cells, there were mutations in certain either gene pathways or certain genes. There were some that were in a group called WINT, the WINT pathway. You're going to hear more about this throughout the year, this quarter and next. There's another here called SHH, or SHH, Sonic Hedgehog. It's a really important one. I'm going to come back to that in a moment. There are a couple others. We call them uh, Group C and Group D at the time. Now we call them Group 3 and Group 4. Uh, one of them has to do with the uh, oncogene called MYC, and the other has to do with a lot of neuron genes. But Really, all I'm trying to say is that we were able to take the DNA, take the genes, and say, you know what? These medulloblastomas, when you sort them out, they're really four different tumor types, four different weird things going on in their genes. All right, everybody remember this guy. <laughs> I'm not going to make any comments, but this would be President Obama. And so sometime while you were in secondary or high school, you heard about something called the Precision Health Medicine, Precision Health Initiative or Precision Medicine Initiative, goes under various different names. And wouldn't it be nice if I could find the particular aberration or mutation in a tumor or the particular gene that's gone wrong in some disease, wouldn't it be nice that I could have a nice targeted therapy, kind of like a key going into a lock? And so it only affects the bad things, those bad genes, and doesn't affect anything else. Be very nice. Um, so that's sort of what the Precision Medicine Initiative sort of launched as, and there's been a lot of enthusiasm, and not to deflate the enthusiasm, but there are limitations to it. I'm going to just talk a little bit about it. So let's get back to this young boy, DJ. So we went ahead and, and I, I treated his tumor in 2005, 2006, and by the time he was age 9 in 2007, regrettably, the cancer had come back. And that was just awful. So his tumor came back or recurred, and we were a little bit smarter a couple years later. And so we did some work in the laboratory. This was at the time with uh, Matt Scott and then some others outside of 
the university up the street at the place called Genentech. And so we found that he had a somatic mutation, that he had a mutation in this uh, sonic hedgehog pathway in a gene called PTCH, affectionately known as Patch. And I'm not going to get too far into the pathway. There's a cartoon here, but let me just simplify it for you here. This is a cartoon of a cell, and there's this sort of cascade of steps. And Patch kind of keeps the cell from doing anything, kind of like the brakes in your car in San Francisco. Keeps it from going down the hill, because that would be bad. You come back, it's crashed, you lose your insurance, bad deal. So we'd like the cell not to do anything. The cerebellum's formed. But what if those brakes released, became uncoupled? Well, then what happens is this other thing called smoothen just makes the cell grow and grow and make more cells. So wouldn't it be neat, wouldn't it be great if we could find a drug that blocked that pathway, that just sort of shut down smoothen there? And there is. There's a, a drug that was developed at this time or in development around 2006, 2007, called at the time GDC449, now known as Vismodigib. And so that seemed like an answer. We found that this boy had a mutation. We found not only the, the lock, but we found the key up the street, 30 miles at, at Genentech, and thought, well, this will be the, one of the first tests. So he, actually, he was, uh, he was the first child in the United States to receive this drug. It didn't work. And I'm not, I don't want to sound down, but it is obviously a, a disappointment because the tumor regrettably continued to march and we couldn't cure this boy and then he ultimately passed away from his cancer. I want to sort of put out there and I want you to really challenge yourself this year when you hear and think about evidence because sometimes things sound good and the evidence sounds good, the hypothesis sounds really convincing, but then it doesn't work. Why didn't this work, right? Well, there was another patient, this was an adult, who was treated with something called basal cell carcinoma, another type of cancer that also has a patch mutation. This person got Vismodigib, and this is just to simplify this, this is a picture of a scan, it's a special type of radionuclide scan where there's cancer all over the place, and boom, these are some normal spots, but wow, got the Vismodigib, Cancer goes away, awesome. But then a few months later, while on the drug, it all came back. So it's not that simple. So it's not just a one stop, fix the brakes. There are probably other things involved. So in DJ's case too, the drug doesn't get into the brain or spine very well. It doesn't cross into the brain or spine. I'm not gonna get too detailed about it. But there are multiple reasons why the drug didn't work as well as we hoped. So I'm going to introduce this term. It's a little bit farther. We're probably at week eight or nine of the course than we are at week one or day one. But I want to introduce these terms and I want you to think about it. Because what you're going to hear, particularly from professors Baker and Sherlock, is you're going to hear about your own genome. Let me just see a quick show of hands. How many people have taken the plunge in 99 bucks, 23 and me? Anybody? Professor Sherlock has. You don't have to put up your hand, but people are doing it. It's a Christmas gift. I don't know, I might do it for my dogs this year. I don't know if, if what happens if you send in dogs, what happens if you send in dog spit, do they know? I probably should, got different number of chromosomes. Um, but anyway, so when we have mutations, they can occur in various ways. So a mutation can occur in all the cells in your body. So you're born with it. That's called a germline mutation. It started in the egg or the sperm from your mom or your dad and it's kind of inherited. It is inherited. And it's passed to every cell in your body. There could be mutations though, like in a tumor, that are only in a subset of the cells, like those cells in DJ's brain. We call that term clinically a somatic mutation. I'm going to introduce this term. We're not going to go anywhere beyond it today, but this is something I spent a lot of time ruminating and fascinating over. Mosaicism. We all, myself included, have been sort of lulled into thinking that all the cells have all the same genes in your body, but that's not necessarily true. Remember, you're going to hear about cell biology, but just sort of a very brief 
recall, egg meets sperm, we form a cell. And from one cell we go to two, and from two to four, four to eight, eight to 16, and so forth. Mutations can occur anywhere along that way as those cells. So maybe at cell division 128, maybe a mutation just occurs then and only part of your body has it. This is something we call mosaicism. I'm not going to go too far into it, but it's one of these things that's probably going to turn medicine upside down because a lot of, uh, in health, we've sort of thought that all cells are kind of the same. And it's probably a, a fallacious thinking. But let's go back to something that's germline, all the cells in the body. So Sonic Hedgehog, the Sonic Hedgehog gene pathway, really important. Well, in DJ's case, it took a wrong turn at his cerebellum and had a somatic mutation. But you can make a mutation right at the word go. Sonic Hedgehog is really important. Everyone in this room has it working normally because it develops normal face structure, normal eyes, normal midline segments of your brain, normal hands and things like that. If it's not working right, you get a defect. So look at this guy here. This is a lamb in Idaho. Anybody from Idaho? Oh, no one from Idaho. Um, so this is a lamb in Idaho that grazed on a wild corn lily. This kind of got people's attention. What's wrong with the lamb? Any diagnosticians here? Come on, not hard. He's got one eye. So normal structures did not develop. So this is a cyclops. So the middle of the brain didn't develop out. We don't have two eyes. And the reason this is, it's his sonic hedgehog pathway for his midline was just A-OK. -okay. The gene was good, but the environment sort of bit him, or he bit the environment. So he was grazing in this wild corn lily that had a compound called cyclopamine in it. Cyclopamine shuts down the sonic hedgehog pathway. And in fact, cyclopamine was the inspiration for that drug that we used for DJ to try to fix his tumor. So I'm going to come back in the last few minutes here to why does a child get cancer? What causes cancer? And I'm going to say to you, I'm going to cut to the chase here, we largely don't know. It's common. For those of you who went to a school where there was about 300 kids in your graduating class, usually one person in each graduating class has been touched by cancer during their childhood. It's relatively common. It's about 20,000 children per year in the United States. Um, what causes it? There are all sorts of things, some of them genetic, but honestly, big part, we mostly don't know. So this is a lot of what I spend my time thinking about is, why does it happen? And this is a very typical or classic paradigm in human biology. Is it nature, nurture? Is it something that is inherent to me in my genes when I was born? Did my genes make a wrong turn along the way? Or was it something in the environment? Or maybe it's a combination of the two that led to the cancer. So my background, Dr. Karina, Professor Karina's over there. She, she and I like to sit in the hallway and talk about epidemiology, talking about studying human beings in large populations. So one way to get at this is sort of looking at a large sample, a large number of, of kids. So there are things called birth defects, structures in the body, could be hands, heart, cleft lip, cleft palate. They don't grow right. And we've kind of known for years that kids who have birth defects get cancer more often than kids who don't have a birth defect. So the, the classic one is children who have something called trisomy 21, Down syndrome, and we know they're very prone to getting a blood cancer called leukemia. So a birth defect doesn't have to be genetic. It could be environmental, it could be like that Lamb, who was eating corn lilies, got a horrible birth defect from something in the environment. Could be an infection. Very commonly, though, we think they're hereditary, they're genetic. So here's some examples here. You may have heard of some of these. This is one where the spine doesn't develop right, called spina bifida. It can be caused by lack of folate in your diet. When you go to the store, that's why there's folate in your bread. Uh, focobilia, here, there's abnormal limbs from a drug a sedative called thalidomide, which was quite notable in the 1950s and 60s. Uh, here you can have extra digits, might be genetic. 
Sometimes it's multifactorial, environment, genes, we're not sure. So here's what I set out to do about, I don't know, about seven years ago. We know that cancer is dysregulated growth. Well, as it turns out, birth defects are from dysregulated growth too. So maybe I could merge the two interests of mine and see if there's some intersection which will give me a clue. Well, they're not super common, so I'm gonna need a very large population, and here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna go back to the model I had here about genes or environment, and I'm gonna say, well, maybe. Maybe there's a gene that's shared in common between a birth defect, a germline mutation in a gene, a piece of DNA, that causes both the birth defect and cancer. And maybe if I study enough of those kids who have either cancer, a birth defect, or both, I might find some of those cancer-causing genes, which is really what I want to do. I'll fast forward. I'm not going to get too far into the details for uh, limits of time, but we've done this, and this is one of the great things. How many people from the state of California? Should be about half of you. Ra rah, California. California is great because of what? Oh, everything, everything. Well, we got a large population, got a lot of votes. Please do vote in November on the bash plug. But outside of that, we've got incredible bureaucracy. Thank God, California. We have more bureaucracy than any other state. But because of that, California also has the largest birth defects registry in the world. And we've got one of the largest birth registries in the world. And so we can take these registries, cancer registry, birth registry, birth defects, merge them and see what happens. And we did. And sure enough, we, I'm not going to get into the details here if they're on the slide, if you want to look at the details of how the study is done. But basically, in concept, what you're going to do is come up with kids who have a cancer and a birth defect, and then kids who have cancer without a birth defect, and I'm going to do kind of something, I don't know, not sneaky. Some people might think it's sneaky. I'm going to go back and look at blood from when you were born. And so how am I going to do that? Everyone in the great state of California, when you go to your pediatrician, when you're about a week of age, the doctor takes a little bit of blood from your heel, your mother or father screams, it's a really horrific event, <laughs> and they're looking for metabolic diseases. But the good thing in the bureaucracy of California is those cards, they're called Guthrie cards, they're kind of like little filter paper, those are kept anonymously, they're protected, they're not just thrown around, and they're available to researchers so we can actually look at genes. So we can actually look at the genome of these people who were born 20, 25, 30 years ago and see if we can find the aberrant or mutated genes. And we found so far there's certainly a much higher risk of getting medulloblastoma if you have a birth defect. We're sort of at that point right now still dissecting the genetic picture, but that's sort of where we are. I'm going to just circle back to you because if you came to me in clinic 10, 15 years ago and your child had the tumor medulloblastoma and said, do you think they inherited it? Was it a germline mutation? I'd say, ah, don't be so hard on yourself. Get out of here. That's probably not right. Probably about 15 or 20% of medulloblastoma is inherited from a bad gene. And so this is back to my, my friends in Toronto. And so it's a little bit of a complicated slide but that's what's gonna make the core great for you. You're gonna get a lot of data. And I'm going to encourage you always to simplify, take a step back, and say, wait, what am I looking at? Well, I've got risk, something called relative risk on the x-axis. The risk, risk greater than one is not good. Less than one means it ain't gonna happen. Greater than one means it's gonna happen. And then on the y-axis, I've got all these genes. You may have heard of some of these. I mentioned patch, PTCH1 right there. Anyone ever hear of something called BRCA, BRCA, breast cancer gene? <coughs> right, so if that's a gene that runs a mutation in your family, it means someone's more likely to get breast cancer, prostate cancer, and other things. So we're starting to find out in these different groups, both WINT, Sonic Hedgehog, group three, group four, formerly known as C and D, that your risk of having a gene that might be related in some way we don't understand. I really don't understand, none of us do, how does BRCA2 
relate to getting medulloblastoma, but it does. And so this is a be, to be continued story. It's sort of the great part of science and human biology that we've got a lot of things to do. I've kind of given a short shrift this morning to things like the environment. I mentioned folate deficiency can uh, cause birth defects and it has been linked loosely to medulloblastoma. People have tried to look at air pollution, traffic density. I've done this with colleagues across the Bay at the Department of Health. Not a lot's come out, so if you live on the 280, 880, 580, pick your 80 corridor, not a big problem. Viral infections, maybe CMV, not so clear. Hot dogs! Anybody like hot dogs? I had two at the Coliseum on Saturday night. Um, yeah, there was a thought that nitroso compounds, which are used to cure the meat, might actually induce mutations. There's some credence to it. It's probably not super good. So I'm going to close here and just come back to human biology. So I hope I've tried to make the case to you in the last 35 minutes why this approach is really necessary. I'm kind of biased. I'm a product of this university in Humbaya, but we need leaders who can advance the human condition with combined perspectives. Not only biology, but you're going to need society, culture, you're going to need the whole thing. You're going to face a lot of problems. I'm not going to read these off, but you've got a lot of things facing you. Cancer, climate change, world hunger, individual and societal evolution and revolution. All sorts of problems. Don't get too down. There's always been problems. I'm very optimistic about the future, but you're going to have to keep coming up with new tools and new ways. And I think the skills that you'll get here, as I sort of dissected them out earlier, things like cell biology or neuroscience, anthropology, public policy, you're going to get them throughout the core. So this required interdisciplinary approach to understanding problems is really what has led me, I guess about almost 40 years later, what I need to confront brain tumors or brain cancer in children. Uh, the Humbio core comes in A side, biological sciences, B side, social sciences. You can look at the slide every now and then. We try to bring the two together. We try to do it even in a number of lectures, what we call modules or even little bites during the course so that you see that not one problem is solely biologic. It may be behavioral. It may be a social problem. Um, the world is not that simple. <laughs>